we just gather together today, Lord, with a heart of thanksgiving, Father, for all the things that you've done for us, all the things that you are doing behind the scenes and in full view. We thank you for your spirit just flowing freely this morning. We ask, God, that you would just be with everyone that is anxious or fearful or concerned, Lord. Let them know, Father God, that you are in full control, Lord, that you have all these things under control and to keep our eyes focused like a flint on you, Father. Yes, amen. We thank you for this, Lord. We trust you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Because he lives. I can face
proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns. 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 sing this song uh, I think Charlotte wrote it quite a while back in light of the all the stuff that's going on around us in our news our politics our world and everything I just think we need to be reminded that Christ shall reign hallelujah I hope that's the right key I don't know <laughs> for Christ shall reign that again in the lower key. Page five. Page five. For Christ shall raise. Is that a good key or no? For, I don't know. Yeah, I ain't singing by myself in a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> For Christ shall raise. Till every enemy goes underfoot. Until
words to her song. We're going to get her to sing her song. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was thinking of that song that she wrote so long ago, For Christ Shall Reign, and I was just thinking of how that we get so caught up in the daily mess going on all around us. Sometimes we get all carried away, we get anxious, full of anxiety, and we forget Christ shall reign. He shall reign. She'll be right here. <laughs> turned around tossed up and down don't be discouraged when you shake in your fist and said I'm not taking this anymore when you've cried your but then another one appears and your heart is breaking in two lift your voice unto me get down on your knees for I know my plan for you
Yes, I've counted your every tear For in your whisper and your prayer Oh, there I'll be In a whisper and a prayer There Page 31. Healing wings, give us your
into your life. Lord, change our minds from thoughts of death into your life. Lord, change our minds from thoughts of death into your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Song. Sing another song. <laughs> you want to play? No. Uh, how about on the door? On the door. Do you have it? Okay. I got it. There it is there. Uh, and Darren always played it in D. I don't know if it's a good, I mean, uh, Go G. Ahead. I'm sure it's fine. I don't know if it's right key from here or not. I'm, I'm the door. I'm no man enters but by me. I'm the master. But by me I'm the master I'm the one Who sets men free I'm the light That in you dwells I'm your heaven With no hell I'm the door And no man enters by me I'm the answer to mankind where sufferings be I'm the light shining bright just for thee I'm the king the lord of all I'll make you stand So follow me and you'll go 
something I'm going to share a little bit and then we'll see what happens <laughs> praise the Lord uh, I know we, we've been kind of quick today but the Lord laid something on my heart I just feel to share and uh you know, I was thinking, and to, to preface this, I'm going to go over into the book of Judges for a little bit and, and then uh, into the book of Kings and Chronicles. But the thing I wanted to share was this. You know, we have heard so many times. I was thinking how all through the Scriptures, all through the Old Testament and even into the New, it had been prophesied for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. And you know how it is, us being human beings, when we hear something after a period of time and don't see anything, we become kind of calloused over in our thinking and our feelings. Uh, heard somebody put it this way, and it was, it was really interesting. You know, we go back, going back years ago, people would say, uh, uh, the Lord's got this new thing. There's a new revelation. There's new this. And we get all excited because God's fixing to do something really new and really great. And then nothing would change. And, and, and then you hear it again a little bit, maybe a year or so later, oh, something new, something great. God's got this new revelation, and we, we get all excited, and nothing happens. Well, after doing this for 15, 20 years, after somebody goes, somebody goes, I got a new, God's bricks and do this, we go, yeah, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I, I, I've thought how that we, we've been talking about, you know, in the Old Testament, they said, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, he's coming, he's coming. He's coming. And it became such a ritual and a tradition and a, a topic of just general conversation that when Messiah was born in their midst, they didn't recognize him. And I thought how that we've been preaching and teaching and talking about this, this Melchizedek thing uh, for some time now. Uh, this is not a new thing. And, you know, uh, we can get into all the different revelations in Greek and Hebrew and all the stuff you want to get into. And the truth of the matter is we, we're almost ho-hum about it. Uh, it doesn't change the fact. It doesn't change the fact that there's about to be a manifestation like we've never seen before. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, the thing I was thinking is this. All through history... And all through the Bible and, and just in, in all of the cultures, when God gets ready to do something that literally changes the order of the world, He does it through a group of little no-name nobodies that come together not to change the world, not to make a name for themselves or, or to, to have a ministry worldwide or whatever. He does it through a group of people that are hungry only for God. Amen. And unbeknownst to them, God uses that hunger to revolutionize and change the world. Uh, I was thinking of, of how that, and, I, and I've told this story before, and, and I, I just want to kind of pass it along real quickly in, in, uh, so that you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, in 1906, Azusa Street, they, they were just coming together because they were hungry. That's all. They, they weren't figuring on changing the world. And look what happened. I was thinking about in the 19, late 19, 1940s when that group of college students up in Canada got together uh, uh, on one of their spring breaks or Easter break, whatever break it was, I don't know. They all got together just, just to worship the Lord. They, they didn't plan on doing anything other than getting together and worshiping the Lord. And look how it exploded in the latter rain movement around the world. And... I could go through things in the Bible. David going to check on his brothers. He wasn't there to change the world or to, to defeat a, a Goliath or to do those things. He was there to bring bread and wine to his brothers and cheese to his brothers that, and inquire of the battle. That's all that boy was there for, 16, 17-year-old boy. And look what happened. 
uh, look what happened in Acts 2 when they all got together waiting on the tearing for the promise of the Father. And that revolutionized the world. Well, why am I saying all that? I'm saying all this for a reason. I believe that we're on the verge where God has begun to put in the hearts of, of certain people. Certain people. It's not going to happen everywhere. I'm sorry. It's just not going to do it. Uh, it. This sounds almost elitist in its comments, but I don't mean it to be that way. I'm merely making a prophetic statement here that right now there is a seed that's been planted in the hearts of individuals all over the world, here and there and everywhere, and they're beginning to feel the awakening as God says we're coming together. And when we come together, God, not, not to change the world, but merely to hear the voice of the Lord, to seek His face. Watch what I'm telling you. It's going to revolutionize and change the world. Because I believe that we've gone as far as we can go with our training, our education, our studying, our prayers, our singing, our preaching, our whatever. We've gone as far as we're going to go. And the expression that I use is this, as our nose is against the veil and we've gone as far as flesh can take us and our strength and our, our efforts. It is now up to the hand of God to put his finger on those that he has chosen in him from the foundation of the world to translate them through the veil into the presence of God. And, and if you'll remember, when the high priest went behind the veil, it wasn't so that they could just all have a good prayer meeting. He went on literally on behalf to change all of Israel. And that's what I feel like God's about to do. Now, I want to I share this because uh, I want us to see what God's doing here the, uh, in the book of Judges. I believe it is, the Bible said that the Gileadites, they were a, a, a tribe of Israel, and they had gone to war with Ammon, and they had begged their brethren, some more of their brethren, uh, 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 the Ephraimites, please help us, please help us, and they wouldn't do it. Uh, and, and here's the thing that's so interesting. Gilead, the Gileadites, their name in the Hebrew means a rocky, rocky place. And as I got to reading and studying that a little bit, I began to realize that there's a select group of people in God that we've seen some really rocky and hard times. We've been through a lot of crazy stuff, and, and it would seem our brethren, and, and, and I want you to hear me with the ear of the Spirit today, our brethren, the, 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 they call them the Ephraimites, they are the doubly fruitful ones. They're the ones that, that don't want to get involved in a lot of things, and they have a tendency. Let me tell you something. The closer we get to the manifested glory of God, the easier it is to get led astray. The easier it is to get pulled aside with this doctrine or that doctrine or all of these different things that are out there. And, uh, uh, one of the things and, and, and that, that we hear a lot is the finished work stuff, and we hear a lot of the great stuff stuff and we hear all of this stuff and it's easy to pitch your tent on those roads on those levels but there is a an order in God that he has chosen in him and for for just for a word I'll cause it I'll call it Melchizedek but I'll be honest with you I hate to put a name on anything because everybody wants to make a doctrine out of it or make a a, a a new order out of it so so I'm just using it for identification only right now but the Bible said that they had defeated, they had finally defeated the Ammonites. Uh, and so now, now because the victory was in the hands of the Gileadites, their brothers suddenly wanted to be a part of the victory. It doesn't, doesn't that sound familiar? Amen. Whenever you fight the battle and those that you wish to be there to help you and hold you and strengthen you don't want anything to do with you. We, we're in a time now where nobody, everybody's scared of everything. We don't want, we're afraid to open our mouth because somebody's going to call us names. Somebody's going to say you're a this or you're a that. And, and they want to ruin your reputation. They want to ruin everything about you. But there are those that have been in rocky, hard places. And I'm here to tell you that, that God has begun to give a victory like nothing else. Now, the, 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 the Ephraimites, they came along here in the book of Judges. They came along, and I want us to hear this because this is kind of interesting because here's what I see the Lord doing in, the, in this hour that we're living in right now. The Bible said the Ephraimites, they came along there, and they said, we want to be a part of this victory. And their brethren, the, Gile the Gileadites, they said, nah, you can't be a part of what God's doing right now. And I'm paraphrasing all this. And the Bible said that the, the Ephraimites begin to try to infiltrate does this sound familiar? How many times has God begun to move in what I'll, for lack of a better word, I'll call them kingdom circles? How many times has God really begun to move in a powerful new way and suddenly you got people come in, they know the language, they know the catchphrases and the buzzwords and they know all this stuff and in reality they might be new age or they might be this or they might be that. And, and so what happens is the word gets polluted and pulled down so that God's people are robbed of victory here and there. The Gileadites, they came along and they said, look, you cannot be a part of this. So here's what we're going to do. The Bible said they came to a narrow place. 
And can I tell you something? You remember what Jesus said? Straight as a gate, narrow as the way. The word narrow there in the Greek means narrow wing, means the closer you get into this, the more narrow it gets. Remember that? <coughs> well, they came to a place where it was so narrow, only one person at a time could come through. And here's, here's the funny part. The Ephraimites and the Gileadites, they looked just alike because they were brethren. They talked just alike because they were brethren. So what are we going to do? And I thought it interesting how that of all of the words in their Hebrew language, this one tribe could not frame to pronounce. And I, I, I'll, I'll get into that word frame in a minute. It's the word there in the King James. But it said... When it came time and the enemy, and I, I'll call them brethren, they really weren't the enemy. I want us to understand this. It was not the enemy that was attacking God's people. It was one of their own. Amen? Have you ever noticed that people that, that have no association with you, have no understanding, they don't worship with you, they, they might even think you're kind of nuts a little bit or something. How many knows they don't bother us near as much as the ones that hug our neck? They don't bother us near as much that sit beside us in our meetings and, and supposedly worship with us and, and, and they hang out with us and they go to eat with us and all this other stuff. They're the ones that you got to look out for. And so if they all look alike, they all sound alike, they all talk alike, except for one word. And I thought it was interesting. And the Gileadites said, here's what we're going to do. When they come through, they're going to ask them, are you an Ephraimite? And the Ephraimites knew they would be put to death and they said, no. No, we're one of you guys. We're one of you guys. And the Bible said, here's what you do. Tell them to pronounce Shibboleth. The one word in their language that the Ephraimites could not, the Bible said, frame to pronounce. They were unable to say the word. And the word, when they tried to say it, came out instead of Shibboleth, it came out Sibboleth. Well, for most of us, we don't have enough discernment to know the difference. It's just a word, right? As a matter of fact, <laughs> matter of fact, depending on where you're from in the United States, our accent changes all over the place. Right. Amen. You know, I, I used to be able to tell somebody from Texas or somebody from California or some. I can't tell anybody anymore. They're all mixed up. <laughs> but but here they are. They start coming through there and they said, "Pronounce now, Shibboleth." And so the person would say, "Shibboleth." They would kill them. The reason being is because they were part of. A, a false front. They were there to pollute. They were there to drag down and, and to cause the word to not be pure. And that word, and here's what is so interesting. That word frame, and the Bible said in King James there in the book of Judges, they could not frame to pronounce it is the way it reads. The word frame there in the ancient Hebrew means the opening of a seed. There's a seed of God. How many knows the Bible said, He is a light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. There's a seed of God in every man. But here's the problem. Every man in his own time, in his own order. Amen? And so here we find what took place was this. That, that, that when, when they were the Ephraimites, they had the seed, but the seed of God was not for that day and time. It would not open up. They could not frame it. They could not pronounce it. And therefore, they could not walk into the fullness of this thing at this time. Now, here's the difference of this. I want us to understand this. The word shibboleth in the Hebrew means a flowing stream, a flowing life force, if you please. And here we find, isn't that what God's doing now with those that can hear the voice of the Lord? There is a flow and an anointing that destroys every yoke. Have you ever said in a meeting and two people get up one person just makes your hair stand up and you feel a leaping inside of you because there's an identify identification there of the spirit of the lord somebody can get up right behind them and say the exact same thing and you feel nothing it's because there's a life flowing river that comes out of one individual that's not yet been loosed in the other and so the word shibboleth means a flowing stream a life-giving stream that's what that actually means. The word sibboleth, on the other hand, and I thought this is so interesting, it means that which is produced from the earth. And, and I love this. You're going to like this right here. I thought it was really graphic. But it said it comes from a Hebrew word, which means the trail that a snail leaves. It looks like a river, but it's just a little slimy trail. 
And I thought to myself how interesting that is because there are those that would come and get in. Now I'm saying all this for a reason because I want us to understand something. God is about to do something we have never witnessed in our lifetime. We've heard about it, sang about it, wrote about it, preached about it. But there's about to be a manifestation like we have never witnessed before. Uh, I'm here to tell you, just like they said for years and years, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. Nobody thought to look in the manger. Nobody thought to look in the stable. Nobody felt the anointing or the discernment to go and do that. But it did not stop what God did that changed the order of the entire universe. So it is that there are those that God is beginning to separate. The shibboleth and the shibboleth. Those that there is, an, you cannot deny the flowing life-giving force of this one or that one. And there, and there were those that would get up and try to duplicate the same sound and there's no anointing there. Now, having said all of that, the thing that the Lord began to give me was this this morning. The Bible said that David was king over Judah. And he'd been king over Judah a little over seven years. And you can preach that any way you want to, praise perfected, et cetera, et cetera. It goes all kinds of ways. But there came time for a change, for David was not yet king over all of Israel. He was actually king over just only two tribes. The other tw uh, ten tribes was called Israel, and they had not yet been united. They'd had their own king. It was an ungodly king, and it came time to change the order of things. It came time uh, 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 for God to do something, <coughs> and yet... The ten tribes really, at this point in time, didn't know what to do. They didn't know what God wanted. They didn't know the direction. Does this make any sense to anybody? Hey Amen. We don't know what's going on. I talk to people all the time. We don't know. We, we, you know what does God say? I don't know. What's, what's coming up? I don't know. What, what's going on this year? I don't know. The more I look at the news, the more confused I get. You know, we don't know what God's doing. And you hear all of these churches, these established religions, they're trying their best to scamper around to protect what they had before, not realizing it's God at work that's been smashing all that, the, the, these old hierarchies and all this mess going on. Because God wants to deliver His creation. Now, the Bible said they begin to come together, the, 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 the sons of the various tribes, and, 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 and names of tribes and how many came along and everything. And uh, it began to name all, the, all, all 12 tribes. <clears throat> the thing I thought was interesting is they came... They came to what is known as the sons of Issachar. You'll find this in the scripture. And I thought it is so appropriate. Because you know, be, many, the Bible said many are called, but few are chosen. All 12 tribes were called. But only God chose. And, and, and let me just back up and say this right here real quick. Uh, the scripture has a, 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 there's a scripture, a verse in, in one of the minor prophets, and I'd have to look it up to find it for you real quick. It says, uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And you think, well, number one, they were brothers. Number two, how come who, God who is love, how can he hate? So how can he hate? Well, the, that, that's really a wrong translation of that Hebrew word. What it actually translates into is, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I loved less. Well, if God is love, how can he love anything less or anything more? It's all the same because he's, he's love, right? Well, the literal translation of that entire passage of Scripture is this. For my purposes, God said, for my purposes, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I loved less. And the best analogy I can give you is, is something like this. If you need heart surgery, you know, you've got to go to the hospital for heart surgery you would say, my, my heart surgeon have I loved, but my garage mechanic have I hated. Because you don't want your garage mechanic in there with his wrenches in your chest. <laughs> it has to do with purpose of that time at that appointment. So what God was saying is, I've got an appointment. There's something I'm, I purposely am trying to accomplish. And therefore, there's ones that I favor above the other. Not that I love them more, but this one's more capable than that one. And so forth. Now... Here we get into these, these 12 tribes. And the Bible reads this way, names of tribes and names and numbers of the sons that come together for this big coming together so they can get the mind of the Lord and they can figure out what they need to do. 
And it comes to the sons of Issachar. And it said, and the sons of Issachar numbered, and it gives a number. And it said, for they had a mind to know what the people ought to do. They had a mind to know what the people. There is those that God has appointed and he's placed within their spirit saying, this is what we need to do. We may not know direction. We may not know uh, the time. We may not know anything, but we know we need to come together. There's some things we need to accomplish. And the Bible said when they come together and the sons of Issachar, one of them said this and one said this and one said this. The sons of Issachar stood up and said, here's what we need to do. We need to make David king over all of Israel. And the Bible said they all come together because they recognize that as the voice of the Lord. Now, I, I, I want us to hear this. David, when David, I want us to see the direction this thing is taken because I feel in my spirit this is what God is doing right now with this priestly order that we've been preaching about, singing about, and talking about for a long time now. And it doesn't seem like there's any changes. It doesn't seem like anything's going on. I'm here to tell you, watch the direction that I'm hearing the Lord say. He said, I've got some sons of Issachar, and you have been voicing your opinions that here's what we need to do. And this is what we're going to do. And so some things have been set in motion, ladies and gentlemen. Things have been set in motion. Now the Lord said that here comes David. They made him king. Well, why why was it necessary David be king over Israel? Because God put something in David's heart that had to be accomplished. And he couldn't do it till he was king over Israel. What was it? We need to get the Ark of the Covenant, which represents what? The manifested glory of God. We need to get it in the place where it belongs. See, the Ark of the Covenant, remember when it had been stolen from the Phil- the Philistines, stole it? And, and the Bible said, remember all that? And, and, and so they, they, they took it and, and they set it up in their temple, the temple of Dagon, the fish god. And what happened was the next morning they found the fish god face down with his hands and head broke off. Remember that? And they said, oh man, the, the God of the Israelites is too powerful. We need to get rid of this thing. So they put it up on, the, watch this, they put it up on a cart with a couple of, of oxen and no driver and they just kind of, Giddy up, go, and that thing, God led led that thing all the way back to Israel. Now, it had been set aside for over 200 years in a place that was not Jerusalem, which is where God wanted it, in Zion. So here's David. He's got it in his heart. He said, I know what we need to do now that I'm king. First order of business, I'm bringing the ark home. Because until God is in his rightful place in our lives and in our world, things are a mess. So the Bible said, and I want you to watch this, Bible, and, and, and I can hear David saying, you know, I preached this for a, a lot of years, this particular story, and it didn't dawn on me until just now, as I'm standing up here, it didn't dawn on me until this. Remember, the Bible said David, he, he builds a new cart, and he's got the oxen, remember that? So the, as a matter of fact, the Bible said that David's showing all of his honor. The Bible said it was a brand new cart, in which nothing had ever been there. Uh, it was brand new, totally undefiled, totally unassociated with anything in the past. And I thought, well, David had the right idea. He, he's trying to honor God. Well, why would David do that, first of all? And it just now hit me as I'm standing up here. I thought to myself, why would he do that? Because the last thing he heard was the Philistines put it on a cart. And God honored it. God honored them by not killing everybody. And let, let him bring the ark home. So David says, that's a good idea. I'm going to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Remember that story? But that's not God's way. My purpose. My purpose. That's what he's doing. He's got a purpose that's bigger than anything. So here we go. First thing he does, we know the story. He, he, he starts to move the ark on this new cart. The Bible said the oxen stumbled. A man named Uzzah reaches out and touches the ark. All good intentions. All good intentions. He reaches out to, to steady the thing. And, and the power of God kills him on the spot. <clears throat> and David said, we're naming this place para Uzes Because God has made a breach against this man. And he turned aside, the Bible said, and put the ark in the house of Obed-Edom. And for three months, and I, I'd always preach this, for three months, that, 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 that uh, uh, the, the ark was uh, turned aside in the house of Obed-Edom. And so God is blessing the house of Obed-Edom. And one day, David gets word about how the blessings of God are doing so well and, uh, on the house of Obed-Edom. And, 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 and it dawned on me as I was preaching this one day, David had given up moving the ark 
back to Jerusalem. He was terrified because the last time he tried to do it, his only way he knew to move God didn't work and somebody ended up dead. So he didn't know what to do. But he knew now because the messenger said, there's nothing being blessed in all of Israel like the house of Obed-Edom. His going out is coming in. Everything about Obed-Edom is blessed. David said, I've got to get the ark home, but I don't know how to get it home. And the next verse says that he called aside all of his scribes, his scholars, all the, the, the learned men of the day. And he said, get into the files, get into our history, find out how are we going to move this ark. The Bible said it was discovered that God had Aaron and his sons moving the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders. And that's what David said, that's what we're going to do. Now, why are you saying all of this thing here? Because God says, this is what I'm doing. I'm putting the Ark upon the shoulders of my chosen ones. They're the ones that are the shibboleth. They're the flowing streams. They're the ones that has a life force. You wonder why you've been going through hell? You wonder why things have been upside down in your life? Some of us for all of our lives. We, we've, got, we've got family members that haven't suffered like we've suffered. We, we, we've got friends and neighbors and, and, and relatives that haven't had to deal with some of the things. And we think, my God, why is my life so messed up? Why is my life so screwed up? Uh, when when uh, you know this one and this one and this one seem to be blessed at every turn, it's because God said, I have got those that for my purposes I've hid until today. Get ready and mark my word. There's some changes coming because the sons of Issachar are hearing a sound nobody else can hear. And they're beginning to issue a word that's not registering with everybody. There's going to be a movement like we've never seen before as the chosen ones begin to come together and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And God's going to cause like minds everywhere to begin to come together. I don't know if I'm making any sense or not. Sound like I'm almost railing against some stuff. I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm trying to tell you. I'm excited because, folks, I'm hearing something I've never heard before. There is a Melchizedek company that God is getting ready to raise up. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into it today. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, let Zach or Derek or some, one of you guys come up and take the mic here in a minute. But the Lord began to show me something about Melchizedek. I'd never seen before in the Garden of Eden. And the Lord willing will be sharing that in the days to come. But I want us to understand something. Just as sure as everything in the scriptures came to pass in its time and in its order, so are we going to witness some changes. You know, if I, can just, if I can just put it to you like this. Never in our lifetimes, and I'm talking about our lifetimes right now, all of us, whether you're watching or you're here, did we ever think we would see America come to the place it is now? You know, whatever side of the political spectrum you're on doesn't matter. You got to admit, some changes are, 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 are underway that's going to totally alter the course of our lives, like it or not. We didn't think we'd ever see it. We are a generation that's been raised pretty much in a time of peace. And we're about to see some things change now. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is our example. Amen. Now, because we know that, we, get, we think we get to pick and choose the stuff that he is our example for. But the truth is, he's our example in everything. And one of the things that, that I was sharing is this. They were under Roman rule in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were under Roman rule. And they were under total bondage. If you said anything... At all. If you were now they tolerated, because they didn't want an uprising, they tolerated the Jews and their religion because they didn't want an uprising. But you could not publicly come out and make statements against Caesar because that, that would get you in serious trouble. And J Jesus stayed in all kinds of trouble because he said, My kingdom is not of this world. And he would talk about a kingdom of God and he would talk about that. And so the, the, the climate of the day was you can't say and do that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? We're in that kind of a climate now. We're in that kind of a climate now. You got to be careful what you say. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, I, I said, and some of you may remember this. It's been, I don't know, three, four, five years ago now. When the mayor of Houston made the news, she made the statement that she was trying to force all the pastors to submit copies of their sermons before they preached them on Sunday for them to check them out. Of course, they took her to court and, and, and she lost. But, you know, we're in a climate now that could easily change. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying all of these things that we've been hearing about in the past 
is now on us. It's becoming a reality. Well, why are you saying all that? I'm saying that. The flip side of the coin is this. The same stuff we've been preaching and singing and dancing about and talking about, this Melchizedek, this manifested God being raised up in the fullness of a priestly body. We've been hearing about it and hearing about it. I believe we're about to witness the very change of this thing also. Just like all this other stuff that we didn't think we'd ever see, I believe we're about to see it now. I believe we're about to witness as God begins to pull from the four corners of the earth those that he has chosen in himself. They've been hid for a time and a season. God would not allow anybody to raise up and call glory unto themselves if he chose you. And therefore, watch what God's going to do in the days to come. He's going to begin to pull the cover off. Why? Because that flowing river, that shibboleth, that flowing river has to be released so that creation can go free. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if this makes any sense or not, but I tell you what, I'm excited because, folks, I see God bringing this thing to a head. And, and here's the thing about it. It's hard on the flesh. Don't kid yourself. You know, that, that's, that's one thing that, that I've always said. God is going to do exactly what he's going to do. If he's got to hurt your feelings to do it, he's still going to do it. He has never, ever been concerned about the comfort of your flesh. For God is a spirit. And everything he does starts, begins, initiates in the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. But because we're earthly and carnal, we try to go the other direction. And it don't work that way. We have to start having our mind changed. Like that song we were singing, change our minds. Change our minds, our thought processes. Change the way we're looking at everything. Oh, hallelujah. So that God can do what he's about to do. I'm excited because it's, it's good times. As crazy as it is for our flesh, it's still good times in the spirit. Because I believe we've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. Zach, you got something? Come on. Or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> Amen. Good work. Uh, I, I feel that. I believe that. Um, I do think that we're in that time of change, obviously, in the natural, but I believe in the spiritual. Um, I had gotten, you know, out at work. I work in healthcare where we're doing uh, outpatient addiction services, so we're part of um, the vaccination rollout and eligibility and everything, and my company is one of those that required it, so I'd gotten my first uh, dose of vaccine. I was sitting back there thinking. I mean, I know Bob's been ministering on this, uh, but as Gary was saying, that I saw somebody else had posted a thing called Pockets of uh, Christians, um, and he was talking about little clusters, and I was seeing that in this spirit that 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 individually, um, you know, we know that we're cells of the body, that each one of us make up, um, you know, a cell, and then we begin to cluster together, I believe, and I was thinking about that, that the difference of um, some of the days of old, and I believe this is, and, and, I, and I hope I get this out clearly, relevant to where we are spiritually in days of old different diseases and viruses have impacted humanity differently um, we look at like the black plague when it came around um, there really was no answer <laughs> other than trying to they didn't even know what it was at first and they were just bringing it over in droves on boats and through the mice were spreading it, and all the different stuff that was going on there was no knowledge of what it was and you even go back to the camps of israel that's why there was all the commandments i believe by god sovereignly with washing of the hands and cleansing to keep the camp safe and keep it clean but back then there was no type of vaccination or no type of answer to that um, but they still face as gary said a lot of the same problems not just with virus and disease but i believe a lot of the same exact problems that we're facing today because i don't believe that these are just unique problems uh to 2021 or 2020 um, I, I say this all the time whenever I talk about drug addiction out at work and do education. Uh, drug addiction is not something that's new. Um, any of the addictions you go down is not a new thing. Um, I, I tell them about that like the opioid crisis is such a big thing right now um, as it should be. But the, but the thing isn't brand new. Chinese have been on opium and different plants. And even if you look at the Romans, the gluttony around um, wine and being drunk and the, uh, the sexual imperversions they had, the, the feast where they would feast and feast and uh, throw up and keep feasting. So a lot of the same stuff we're dealing with today is not anything new. <laughs> the difference is, is we're beginning to have an answer for those things. And that's what I was seeing as Gary was ministering that. That's the difference. And I know Bob's talked a lot about this and taught on it some, that the difference of this vaccine isn't that it's just like it used to be where the flu, and I've heard a lot of people, and I know there's a lot of stuff, and I'm not 
uh, trying to make a claim one way or another. I'm speaking spiritually here, but that it's different than a live virus going in and trying to have your immune system respond to that. And Bob's talked about this, but it's inserting a messenger RNA that teaches your immune system to respond and overcome the, the disease right now that we're dealing with COVID or coronavirus. And that's what I'm seeing in the spirit is that we're beginning to receive that seed Gary was talking about has a code in it. The very genetic makeup of Christ was implanted into each and every one of us. As that begins to come forth, there's a messenger RNA in, in there that begins to produce something in us to where it changes the code that we operate out of, spiritually speaking. That, and I believe it will have a physical representation and a manifestation, but I believe it begins to give us answers of how to overcome some of these things that humanity has plagued, been plagued with for thousands of years. And so that's what I'm seeing is that we're not, um, I, I believe Puritanism and uh, rebelliousness for the easiest ways to kind of label it or liberalism and conservatism or however you want to label it isn't a new issue that we're facing. As, uh, um, as, as Gary was saying, we're literally, and I'm not talking politically here, I'm talking about spiritually, stay with me on that, that we're in the midst of it, and it, I mean it is politically in the world, but we're in the midst of a, a turn and how many of those societies been through that? Puritanism in the early Americas, that's what it was, was it was a going away from that and a breaking through. And there's always been this cycle of, of lawlessness and rebelliousness. You look at Israel in their day, they constantly had to go through that judgment of God. Why was that? <laughs> because they couldn't stay true to that external commandment that God had given them and all the laws and all the rituals and all the thing. And how many knows that's us today? God's given us this thing. He's given us revelation and we try to act right. We try to do the right things. We try to, uh, because we know the nature of Christ through the Bible and through the, through the Spirit, so we try to act like Jesus would act. That, that whole bracelet, what would Jesus do? <laughs> but see, that's an external thing to where we're trying to act like something. Yeah. That's never going to work. And that's what I'm seeing about this vaccination of Jesus Christ into our lives, that I believe that that's what's happening with these sons of Issachar. Again, we're going to know how to pronounce these things because it's embedded within us now. It's changed the way that we hear things, changed the way we operate to where we're no longer the old man, but we're becoming a new man. See, I was ministering about that last week on uh, the Esau, the story of that. And um, it, it, it talks about that. Let me go to that real quick here. Um, because I think this is so key to what Gary's saying, because here's the thing. If you're not having your genetic uh, uh, code, for lack of a better word, your DNA spiritually um, uh, crafted by the hand of God to where we be can begin to understand how to overcome things the way Jesus understood it. Because how many knows Jesus didn't have a pattern to look after? Right. He was the pattern. See, that's the mindset that has to begin to take place is we don't become Jesus in the fullness like people have talked in the sense of, well, now we're the Christ and he's a Christ. We are becoming the Christ after the Christ in the earth. We're becoming that anointing from the anointing in the earth. See, we're having to become those things as Jesus was the pattern. That's what that's happening in our very makeup is that we're beginning to learn how to do those things, not in an intellectual way, not in an uh, acting way to where we try to act better or act different, but we're becoming something. That's what I think Gary is ministering on, is that, that manifestation of where we become something different. And it may not look different on the outside, it may not be there, but it's going to be apparent, I tell you, in the days to come, to when things do get more difficult in the natural, there's going to be an apparent appearing of a company that's able to overcome those things that the natural world is bound down to with fear and torment and not knowing the left from the right and running scared. See, so there's going to be a people that doesn't succumb to that. Because again, there's yet to be a people truly break that chain and that last enemy that's death. See, that's what has been operating. And that's where I'm seeing is that Christians in all the days gone by and in all the other moves of God and even Israel had to have an external instruction, an external commandment, an external word to just try to act right, to make it through life, to make it to heaven one day. See, we're a people that's operating differently. We're not believing in trying to follow a set of rules and regulations. And I believe in human nature. That's why we have laws. We have morality. We have things to try to get, to try to teach children how to act, to try to teach us how to act, how we should, how we shouldn't. But see, all that's an external way of living. It's all a code, an external code. I'm talking about an internal code that changes how we operate to where it's no longer uh, having to be reminded of maybe we shouldn't do or do that or uh, not do that, but it becomes who we are as a person just as Jesus was. 
See, that's what I was thinking of is he, uh, as I said, he didn't have something he was following after. There was something innately in him that was being manifested in the earth while he was on the earth. And as he began to go to the cross and release that, that became a reality that was available to all creation at that point. And God is calling those um, one by one. See, I was thinking of that as I was getting my uh, vaccine. See, there's a, there's a rollout, there's a phase, and there's an order to that. Not everybody can just go get them right now. Uh, because there's a 1A phase, a 1A1, a 1A2, and so we're part of that 1A2, but the first people to receive them, and I thought this spoke of us spiritually, were those that are in the hospitals first treating the disease. The first ones that are fighting with life's on the line are the first ones getting vaccinated to be able to overcome that disease so that they can help others come back to life and help others overcome the disease. And how many knows that's the phase we're in spiritually, that we're in that 1A1 phase where God's given us the power to overcome death, hell, and the grave? That's being released unto a first fruit of a first fruit company that can take that very uh, essence of what Jesus is, allow that to begin to produce in our life so that we can begin to deliver other creation as their phase comes. Amen. And that's what I was seeing is there's a phase to where right now it's 75 years old and above and it's going to become 65 and above. And this is Tennessee. I don't know other states if it's the same, but uh, 55 and it's going to begin to titrate. And how many knows that's what the scripture I read last week says? Every person in their own rank and own order until the last enemy is put underfoot. But it doesn't say that everybody gets it at once. And I believe spiritually, uh, I mean physically, there's something patterned after the spiritual reality of what's going on right now. Because something hit the earth that nobody in any country had the answer to. And I know there's conspiracy all around where it came from, how it came about. Uh, was it an evil motive? Was it a natural cause? I don't care about all that stuff, to be honest with you, because it's all just distractions. It's, you're missing the mark if we get so caught up into the, the worldly things. And I'm not saying don't have your beliefs, don't have your things. But as Gary was saying at the beginning of the service, refocus our mind upon the Lord to see spiritually what that represents to us and what that means. It's the same thing as reading the scriptures just naturally and missing the mark every time. If we begin to look at the world around us, begin to ask ourselves spiritually, what is happening with all this? What is going on here? We see the shift uh, as Gary was saying, where it may not be as free to always pronounce our beliefs and our faith, just as in other countries right now it's not. So do we go out to Capitol Hill and start to protest and try to change that? That's probably not the way God's calling us to do it. <laughs> we're going to have something produced in us to where when we come in the face of that, we're going to have the answers of how to speak and when to speak and how to do and what to do to begin to overcome because all that order is... As, as I was trying to say earlier, is that's the process of death that's plagued humanity since the beginning. Since that Garden of Eden with Adam that fell into that lower state spiritually and naturally, that death began to enter into him and, and into Eve, and it began to be passed on to all creation. We've had the same issues all along. We just dress it up differently. We change fashion styles, and then they go back to looking like what they once used to look like. We change jobs and orders. We do all this stuff to keep changing on the outside our circumstances to make us feel better. Um, I was watching a uh, show on Netflix, which I thought was really good, uh, about minimalism and about how uh, people think of minimalism as being um, I, actually because, and I think it's spiritually relevant, because God's required some of us to be minimalist <laughs> in the natural and what minimalist is, is it's not just the idea of we have nothing and don't have anything, but they only require something that has a function and a purpose in their life. Because what, what the minimalists have started to learn is that we just have stuff to medicate, to feel good. And that's what he was saying as a young child, one of the men on there, um, and Dave Ramsey's one of the speakers, and it's several good people um, that, that, that are in there talking about things. But one of the guys, he went through a traumatic experience with his mother, and he was going uh, through the boxes and uh, after she had passed away and going through the house like you would, and he had found boxes that were all taped up, and in it were every single school assignment he had ever done and brought home for all those years. And his, what he said he realized is his first thought was, well, my mom wanted those keepsakes, but she had never opened those things in all the years. The guy had to be 30, 40 years, years old by then. So he said it wasn't about what was in those boxes. It was about what she hadn't processed and done away within herself. And see, how many knows that God's requiring us to process some things in our spirits and in our physical and in our psychological to where we can let go of some old things, let go of some old baggage, some old ways of doing things, some old orders, because I'm here to tell you what we're about to approach in the spirit, those old things aren't going to work anymore. 
They're not going to have any place to operate. They're going to have no purpose. And see, that's what that house cleaning and that minimalist belief is, is they actually have a challenge where on the first day you let go of one thing, the second day let go of two, the third day let go of three. Because they said, if it no longer has a purpose and a meaning, why is it in your house? Just to make us feel good. See, I think spiritually that's where God's requiring us to get to is what's in your house right now. The judgment begins with the house of the Lord. And see, I think that that's what's happening is there's a code being released unto a people to where we're beginning to let go of attachments to all those things that have no substance in our life. Now, does that mean that we won't have any family, any friends? Nobody's going to have a job anymore. Nobody's going to have anything. No, that's not what it means here. What it does mean is that we're going to be instructed by the Lord to what has purpose and meaning according to his word and his purpose. See, Gary was ministering about that with Esau and Jacob, and I ministered on that and was going to close out with a little bit of those scriptures. But that Jacob was loved because of the purpose in it. See, how many knows that that's what that's talking about is us only finding purpose in the things that we do. And what's that purpose of? Not to feel good and to feel better about ourselves, but to operate in that plan of God so that we can unroll that, so that we can allow ourselves to succumb to that vaccination of Christ in our life that begins to topple all those other kingdoms, that begins to topple out all of our beliefs, wills, and desires, and begins to teach us how to overcome. Because what we're being vaccinated for is that rotten enemy known as death. And that's where nobody's had that pattern to overcome that besides Jesus. He's the only one that had that, and now that MRA, that messenger RNA that we're getting is from his very essence and very thing of who he is to begin to overcome those things in our life to where until we can overcome those things, we can't deliver creation and do all these things that we talk about. But that's what, uh, as Gary's minister now is seeing so much more, is we're literally in that process of learning the ways, again, not just reading in the book or learning, uh, trying to act right. Um, I, I get that, that, that sometimes... Um, and, 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 you know, I'll just admit it for, the, for what it is, is maybe I say something or do something. They would say, well, that's not what a preacher or a minister should say or do. Well, I'm like, according to who? You know, and I know that we're a people that's a little bit more lax with some of that stuff that the do's and don'ts and thou shalt's and thou shalt not's. And I'm not saying get lawlessness. What I'm saying is there's going to become a balance. So that's what I was ministering on um, first of the year, whenever that was, is that balance that's coming. Because again, we can go so far one way and so far the other way, and both ways begin to miss the mark with what's happening. Amen. And I believe that's where we're at as a nation right now. I truly do. I think we've gotten so far both ways that nobody can find out what's really needing to happen to begin to solve the things that need to be solved. And that's where we're at as a people that, that, that we got to stay tuned to the word of the Lord that's within us. See, how many knows that word is that seed, that very nature? All things were created through that word. That's the only pattern that has the ability to overcome death. And now we have received that from a blessing of, uh, from above. And just to continue with those scriptures, um, as Gary is ministering that about Jacob and Esau, see, I was thinking that, that in the book of Genesis 25, um, verse 23, and we know about Rebecca and we know the story, and I'm not wanting to take too much time here to go into all that, and even with the vaccination stuff, I encourage you to read uh, one thing Bob's book that he had written about DNA in general and about the, the spiritually, what all that means. But even lately, I know he's been doing some teaching um, that, that, that's applicable to where we're at, to where um, they, they, to back up for a second before I get to that scripture, they had told me that a lot of the possible side effects um, would be minimal around, you could possibly run a fever, you could have a lymph node swell. But what they were saying is if you feel that, and I believe that's what we're feeling in our spirit, we're feeling a response to something, something's changing, that that means your immune system's taking uh, activation, it's beginning to respond to it. See, how many knows that's what we're feeling, that's what Gary was talking about earlier, is our immune system's kicking onto where we're responding differently to something, that we feel that something's here, and whenever that thing activates, we're going to have that ability to, to, to really overcome those things, because that's, that's what... Um, that's what that is, is to create that immune system response to where the T cells and the different things can begin to kill that off. So I hope that people in their spirit this morning are feeling that stirring to where we're beginning to, to operate in a new and a different place. But in the 23rd verse, uh, to Rebecca, it says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. We talked about that last week some with uh, uh, Jacob and Esau and uh, the, the selling of the birthright and all those things. And see, spiritually, again, that's what's within us. We have that natural man and we have that spiritual man. 
And that, that natural man, again, as we we're using that illustration of minimalism, wants to hang on to all these old things. Um, sometimes we call them reservations in, in, the, in the meetings and in the addiction world because just in case this doesn't work out, I need something that's familiar and feels good to go back to because as uh, Gary was sharing earlier, again, we've heard that, something new, something new. Well, if that doesn't happen, I need to still be op able to operate in the old because I'm not sure how to operate in the new. But how many knows that, that letting go of those things, see, that's the only way that we're going to be able to allow God to manifest something new in our lives is to let go of the old. So it says the older uh, will serve the younger. And we talked about this where Esau came out and first to come out, he was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. And then we know the story of Jacob. And I want to skip ahead to Obadiah, um, which is a really short book um, that if you want to feel accomplishment in the morning, just read Obadiah. It's pretty, just a couple scriptures, but then you feel like you've you know, read a whole book for the day and doing good and um, powered up. So it says that uh, Edom, which was the nation of the offspring of Esau, that I'm just going to skip down to some because I don't want to read. Um, it's talking about cutting down that nation of Edom and Esau. And it goes on down to um, the verse 17. It says, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance. How many knows in that holy place of God, when we begin to enter into a place that we're entering into that, that spiritual mountain, that Mount Zion, that place, uh, said it will be holy. And Jacob will possess his inheritance. Amen. So as that inheritance was sold, uh, that birthright it was sold, Jacob begins to possess that here. And he says, Jacob will be a fire. How many knows that's what that immune response can be? That's what a fever is. If I begin to run a fever, that means I've recognized there's an enemy in my body. Not me with my brain, but with my system that's built to defend that. It recognizes that and develops a fever so that it can bring that heat to be able to kill off whatever it is that's attacking me. So that's what it says is Jacob will begin to be a fire, a fire and Joseph will be a flame, but Esau will be stubble. And they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. How many knows that's what's going on in our temple right now? That in this holy place, when we gather in, that we get in this place, Esau is beginning to be burnt up changed into something different, that that house will no longer stand because it says there will be no survivors. The Lord has spoken. People from, and, and Gary could probably do a, I'm sure there's a lot in here that if you dug into it, you could really pull out. It says people from the, uh, and I'm going to uh, butcher some of these, Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. And we know a lot about the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. It's talking about some of those tribes and the company of Israelites, exiles who are in Canaan. And that's where Jacob is. We know God, his name Israel, was from that offspring of Abraham um, through the lineage, and that's where it begins to produce that holy nation. And see, that's that holy nation that's within us. That seed that's within us begins to be produced right here, and it talks about us beginning to possess some different camps and different people. See, how many knows that's those different tribes within us, that it's, that it's not just um, we look at the body as singular because we see it on the outside, but as with cells, there's a plurality, plurality there. And in our lives, there's different parts of us that God we've yet to allow to get into. And that's what it's talking about with the different camps, is that those tribes of Israel, those different nations, uh, that, is, that has been said earlier, that were blessed and favored by the Lord, that God loved because of the purpose in them, are beginning to overcome those other places within us. And then it says the, the deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. See, that's that process to where the kingdom that we know uh, made manifest in a people is a spiritual internal kingdom that has to operate to where that kingship we talk about, uh, being kings and priests, we're kings over natures is what, what, what we're talking about really there. Uh, we're not talking about taking rule and dominion again, talking about marching down somewhere physically to begin to change the law and order, but we're talking about through that process of Christ dealing with us that we begin to have a nature that's king-like, that has the ability to overcome things. See, that's where Jesus was, is he had that nature and that ability to any death that came in the midst of him, he had the ability to overcome it. And that's what's happening in us as we're beginning uh, glory by glory, phase by phase, 
to begin to have some things. But again, if we get on that mountain where we just keep circling the mountain of old and not let go of those things that are in us that no longer have purpose and meaning, we're just going to continue to circle around that mountain and never ascend to those heights of Mount uh, Zion and get into the heavenlies and begin to come into a place to where we begin to overcome to where, as it says, Esau no longer has a part in us. See, that's what we're talking about is operating in a place in God to where we begin to understand things that have not yet been understood besides by him, uh, Jesus, the Christ. See, that's where um, in this vaccination rollout and phase, that's the, there's, there's got to be a, a, a first fruit. And I know that they're using a synthetic MRA, uh, RNA for this vaccine. But in reality, that would come from something. That's where Jesus, it's pulled from his very DNA, been implanted into us. And there's a first fruit of the first fruit that begins to receive that so that they can begin to heal other creation. So that's where the hospital workers are at, and that's where the frontline staff, that's who we are. <laughs> We're that frontline staff in the hospital treating people that's lives are on the line with this thing called death. But first, we have to have that ability to overcome it. Um, because we're going to take off these outer garments. See, that's where the vaccine, and I know there's different things about it, um, but there will be no more need for these outer garments and all, all these things that we have that we've operated with, with this things to keep us protected, with masks and with uh, other things. See, there's going to become a people that, that it no longer has any effect on. We no longer have to have these tools that we used to use to stay safe when we come in the midst of death because we're going to have something within us that, that death can't have any power or reign over or any type of operational uh, effect on. It's not going to be able to waver us to where right now uh, we get powered up uh, through whether it's reading scriptures or um, uh, praying or coming into services, and then we go back out and we battle death and we succumb to it in moments and times. See, that's what I'm talking about is being vaccinated to the point spiritually to where death can no longer get us down and beat us down into a place to where we need to be lifted back up just to begin to do this thing again. See, we've, we've had our days, and that's where I believe that going back to the meetings, that power of resurrection is talking about. See, power of resurrection is life. And that's what uh, the song earlier, uh, the, the thoughts of uh, life and light no longer death, See, that's the change that happens to where that resurrection power, after we've been laid down in that grave, after we let go of those things in our life and allow them to die, we're going to be resurrected into something greater to where we begin to minister life and light and we begin to change things but, and we begin to be covered by that very spirit of who Christ is and no longer try to go out and do battle with these things that men have taught us we need to have to do battle in the heavenlies. Again, that's a huge shift in thinking. And that's where I think we're at, um, was being said earlier, is we're in a shift, um, a paradigm shift, to where we're no longer going to try to do battle in the heavenlies the way that people have been taught to do battle in days gone by. Um, we're not casting out demons. We're not, uh, uh, I mean, if God requires us to do certain things, we will always do them. But it's not going to look like what it was, that we got prayer lines and circles and laying on of hands and casting out demons and doing all these things we've been taught in days gone by. Because how many knows that people that operated in that place still succumb to death at some point. But we're talking about operating out of a greater place to where we can overcome and, and, and put that enemy known as death underfoot. Hallelujah. So I just, uh, I'm going to make sure I read that last scripture. I did. So that's, that's all I have. Um, I just, in, in my spirit, um, really believe we're being changed on the inside. And that's the thing is with all this week I'd gotten, I don't even remember what day it was, um, I didn't know every minute or every moment something was going all, on all inside of here physically. I don't know um, all the processes, all the phases. See, I think spiritually that's where we're at as God's beginning to do something. We're going to see the evidence of it every time we come back into contact with death in our lives or others' lives. It's where we're going to operate differently. But we don't really realize what all's going on right now, I believe, um, because God's doing that work. Uh, God's changing, changing the tables of our hearts and rewriting that code uh, to, to know how to overcome. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add or, okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and close out. I know, uh, Gary said we, uh, he had kind of came against a lot of things and we said a lot of things. Again, I hope you can hear us spiritually on here. I know right now, um, a lot of the language can become buzzwords for in the, uh, <laughs> news stations or, social circles or, but I hope when you tune into us every week, you can begin to hear what we're really saying spiritually. Um, as, as Gary said, it's not about elitism. It's not about um, just trying to escape the things of the world to be something different and feel good about ourselves. I really hope you hear the balance in what we're ministering 
um, because there's a sovereignty to it and there's a responsibility to, to really believing that we're receiving something from the Lord first for a purpose. That God loved us because of the purpose in it, uh, not that He loves any other order uh, less as a human and as a, a son of God, but that there's a purpose being given to us where God's going to have favor upon us to protect us, that we're going to be the first ones to receive that, that, that dose that overcomes death in our lives. And how many knows we're ready for it? I know um, <laughs> we felt enough of the death and the dying and the getting beat down and all that, so I know we're ready for it. So I just I thank you and honor you this morning, Lord. I just pray that your spirit um, uh, allows this word that's been given from many this morning through the singing and the worship and the, and the, the ministry and prayer and, and all the things that occurred this morning. Let it impregnate the hearts of our being, God. As was being said, uh, let, it, let it begin to change that very nature of who we are in the inside. Let it change the very code of how we operate to where when this week we go out and we come into contact with those in our lives, whether it's family or workplace or wherever it is that just as you did, Jesus, in the earth, you came into contact with things at certain times and knew you had the answer to overcome it. Allow that to become who we are, that we don't go around touching anything and everything, but that, as I said earlier in that vaccination rollout, allow those that are part of this 1A1 uh, company or however we want to call it, as we come into them, those first fruits of the first fruit, allow us to minister life to them so that they can begin to receive that which you're giving to us in this hour, God that we know it's not for everyone and everything right now, but we know that we have a, fo a focus and a purpose as a Melchizedek order to begin to minister to those that are called to this order so that later on in that rank in their own order, others can begin to come into this thing, God. So I ask you to give us wisdom, most of all, uh, strength and power, God, and a wisdom to carry out these things in your timing. And we just pray and minister to all those that are hurting right now in their hearts and in their minds and in their spirits and in their bodies, God. Allow those that are in that grave to be resurrected up in that spirit of life this week, God. Hallelujah. So we just pray in your son's name, the, the, the mightiest name there is, the only nature that really gives us any answers right now where it seems like there is no answer and there is no hope uh, and there is uh, fear permeating the people of this nation and not just of this nation, but of the uh, earth right now. Let us truly realize the, the, the moment we're in to where we don't use spirituality as a way to escape, but spirituality as a way to overcome these things. See, I think that's the difference of this people is that we're not just going to have words of God and moves of God to try to escape uh, the world as, as moves have wanted to do in the past. We're not trying to escape the world. We're trying to overcome it. We're wanting to take it and put it under our feet and have dominion over it. Hallelujah. So allow us to, to, to awaken to that reality, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, and uh, Bob, he uh, has been down at Florida on the beach uh, soaking up some, no, he's been in, uh, <laughs> he's been up in uh, Michigan taking care of some business. So we'll love to have uh, Bob and Bobby Jean back with us next week. Um, I'm sure the Lord, I know he's been stirring some things in Bob's heart about the time and season we're in as he has with all of us. Uh, but we know that, that Bob's always been given that gift to really eloquently lay out some good visual examples of how it operates and how it, how it works. So we're going to look forward to having them back. Um, be praying for the Titans today. They start in about five or ten minutes. We need a big win. So, <laughs> But in all seriousness, God bless and hope everybody has a good week.